seven o'clock. Y'all better tell somebody about the good news. What we got going on here in Ephesians chapter four, as Paul tries to ex excite these saints. the work of the ministry. Paul is trying to excite these saints uh -oh, to the work of the ministry. <clears throat> Seven along with a few give people a few more minutes. <clears throat> give everybody a few more minutes to join us. Everybody a few more minutes. Uh, give everybody a few more minutes to get this thing started here. Uh, they'll join us when they get here. Yeah, open up your book, open up your Bible, Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. I know last week we discussed uh, some of the work of the officers named in this particular passage the evangelists, pastor, teachers. So, uh, we we'll carry forth with this blessing today, just like that. Just like that, Ephesians chapter 4. Look here. Let's go to God in the word of prayer. Father God, we love you. We thank you. We appreciate you. We know that you love us, and that's why we love you. Thank you for Jesus the Christ, our Lord, our Savior. Thank you for all the blessings that you have bestowed upon us. God, our minds, God, our hearts. May we find some instructions left for the church at Ephesus that may strengthen the church of Garfield Greater Heights. We do all things to give you the glory. We do all things in your authority. By the name of Jesus Christ, we do pray. Amen. Wow. So let's look at what we got going on here. Hey, John, what's going on, John? What's going on? You know, it's me and you so far. <laughs> me and you. We're in Ephesians chapter 4 still. We're in Ephesians chapter 4. Uh... Gave some apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. We talked about that last week. Uh, some of the definitions and titles assigned in this passage. Uh, we know apostles are going on. Prophets can be going on. Um, but evangelists, pastors, and teachers definitely are still in the working of the Lord's church or community today <clears throat> so the apostle talks about these people in the church are said to equip the saints for the work of the ministry equipping the saints for the work of the ministry um the work of the ministry could be a multiplicity of things but it's all the things that a church does to bring God glory. All the things a church does to um, 
make God's presence felt here on earth. Uh, not just, we don't just do things. We don't just have ministries to say we are a busy church. We do ministries and we do things uh, in a godly, orderly fashion that would make God's uh, presence known and felt on earth. Uh, we do things, our ministry then becomes the work uh, that the congregation engages in. Every person, every man engages in the work and the ministry uh, that makes the invisible God visible to all the world. We have you heard it before, it's not anything new. Some people say things like, uh, people may never don the church door, but you are the only message that they will ever hear, or you are the only message that they will ever see. You are the only church that they will ever visit. Uh, so we have to make sure that our ministry and a congregated effort suits the ministry we carry out personally. Uh, every person is a personal ministry even as we come together collectively to engage in a corporate ministry. Uh, so that's why he gave us those characteristics up there in verse number two, because it tells us how to live all the time worthy of the ministry. And so when I'm going about day to day, I am at work in the ministry of the kingdom. I am at work in the ministry of the church. And I, and I hear something that we have to pay attention to because he says that uh, he gave some apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith. We talked about that last week. Uh, but then he says, and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, to the measure of the statue which belongs to the fullness of Christ. What? Paul is trying to relate to the church of Ephesus that we need to give here, uh, uh, heed to today is uh, there is a maturing place that takes place when we all come together. This is important right here because uh, we have more and more people since COVID who don't really, uh, are not active in coming out not just Garfield, Greater Heights, but in the church throughout the country. Uh, people don't come out and they have not come back out in full force yet. It's amazing to me because uh, when we see how powerful corporate gathering is and how encouraging corporate worship is, then that I'm a person who have chose to stay home and not come out in corporate worship then I am one who do not understand the, the impact of congregated worship. Uh, I think it's kind of almost a little bit selfish uh, to sit back and not come out to a congregated worship because you feel comfortable uh, in a individual or independent worship. Uh, but this is what this text is talking about. Uh, the need for the church to come out under these men, under these teachers, under these instructs, persons of instruction uh, to build us up for the work of the ministry. At, but you can't be built up if you're not present. It's hard to be built up in a place that you are not. And you don't build at the same pace as everybody does when you are not coming together. And for the persons who feel like individual worship or at home study, uh, individual study uh, surpasses congregated study, it, it really is a immature person. I'm not trying to fuss at you this evening, but uh, you do have to do your own studies. You do have to do your own growth. But when we come out and grow together, the church moves together. It uh, doesn't look fragmented in her motion doesn't look fragmented in her ministry, doesn't look fragmented in her method because we all come out together. You know, we talk about it all the time, like a sports team and uh, no player is going to start Sunday that did not practice Monday through Friday, uh, that did not join the team except for kickoff time. That person won't play because as good as they are, 
as knowledgeable as they are, they're not in sync with the rest of the team. Uh, they're not in motion with the rest of the team. So Paul says we come out. Um, we come out because we come out to be built up uh, for the ministry of the entire body until we all attain uh, no conference call, no conference call, kind of. We, yeah, that's that's history. Sorry about that. Yeah, we're trying to get everybody up to speed uh, with the uh, Facebook. Uh, so yeah, we don't not doing a conference call. Good evening, Yvonne. Good evening, Barbara, Michelle, Sister Cotton. Look here. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. Now, it doesn't mean that there's a point when we complete our growth. That's not what the author is saying. The author is not saying uh, that we come to a place in time where we no longer need to come out. That's, that's not the idea behind till we all come. Till we all come mean uh, till we reach a place where we are now always in motion as a unit always uniformed and unified in our movement. Now, uniform doesn't mean robotic or like we're in the army synchronized, but to some degree, we are synchronized. And the fact that when the body is moving in one direction, everybody knows the motion and the movement of the body based on the faith principles that Jesus Christ has left us uh, in his holy word and by way of the Holy Spirit. We have to come out and gain this knowledge in a congregated way. It's hard to be united in the work of the ministry for those who don't feel like they have to come out. As a, too many members are not coming back to service yet. And um, I, I don't understand the reasons and they probably have them, but the truth of the matter is, um, I think we have to love God a little bit more uh, than we love the world. Uh, we love the world and we like the world. We like family. We like relationships. We like friends. We like work. And uh, I, I think that we have to get to a place where we like um, God more. We have to like God more. And I say like, of course, I mean love, but we have to like God more than we love the world uh, because, again, we're not sitting home Monday through Friday or Monday through Saturday, but Sunday, for some odd reason, we don't want to come out together. Look, look at the page tonight. Uh, these are people who will sing, I really love the Lord. These are people who say, you know, God has been good to them. But if they know God has been good to them, then they're not being good to God. <laughs> They're not reciprocating the knowledge of the faith to a God that has given them everything and done everything for them. Uh, they feel better or they feel more than coming out. Uh, absolutely, Sister Thorne, they've gotten too comfortable in, in not coming out. And then they justify it by saying, I'm still worshiping. But if you're able to be out because you're able to go to and fro all week, uh, then you should most definitely be in congregated worship. Uh, you can't get the same play. You can't get the same strength. You won't have the same build as the rest of the church sitting at home. It won't happen. Um, and then when we see each other, it's, as if nothing happened, but we're growing and we're growing up and we're growing on. So um, we want to set aside all the uh, childish behaviors of I can do whatever I want to do or I don't have to do what everybody else is doing. That's the whole purpose of this chapter four. Coming out of being saved, Paul makes it very clear that we have been saved as a unit. We have been saved in unity by the bond of the spirit and so since we've been saved in unity and saved to a unit then it's critical that every person able 
should be congregated to gather this knowledge uh, that has obtained in their congregated study. Uh, and coming to a, a, a mature man to the measure of the statue which belongs to the fullness of Christ. Oh, there's a passage, I believe it's over in Luke chapter 2. Uh, I think it's around verse 52. Let me, I, I think that's where I want to be. And I just want to show you something real quick, if I can get there. Yes, that's what it is. Uh, Luke chapter 2. And verse 52. Luke records there, and Jesus grew. And Jesus grew, or Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and stature. Now, if Jesus is increasing in wisdom and stature, and the Apostle Paul writes here that I were coming out under these uh pastor teachers evangelists uh is the purpose to bring us into the fullness of uh of christ and statue then it's, it stands to reason that if christ was witness growing by luke and recorded then our growth has to be a witness growth of record as well um and we grow together see it's not a it's not a matter of who can do what or who's accomplished what. It's a matter of us coming out and growing as one. The growth process never ends. There's never a time in the Lord when we are fully grown. There's never a time in the, we can be mature. We can be seasoned. We can be motherly and fatherly. Uh, first John talks about the older men in, in chapter two of first John chapter two and chapter three talks about the older men are leading the younger men and things of that nature. Uh, but it's not just men, but he's talking to the older of the congregation. So we all will continue to grow and we'll never be grown ups. We'll always be children in God's kingdom, uh, but we can be grown up in our maturity. We can grow up in our maturation of the spiritual people. We must be for the work that God has designed for us. Uh, God never intended this work to be for novice or to be for those who are not understanding of what the church ministry is. A lot of people, probably of the few people that's here tonight and otherwise, if you ask them what is the church ministry or church ministry, they will start naming a lot of things that the church is doing, but I, I, that's not the the work that Paul says here, because Paul says, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the service, and then King James says, for the work of the, the ministry. I said it before most of you got here, the ministry of the church is to make an invisible God visible, to uh, reveal to the world the love of God that they never otherwise would have experienced or had knowledge of had it not been for the ministry of the church. See, the ministry of the church then becomes a unified work because of her oneness with one another that the world takes hold of, even as we go out above the, about the world and about our everyday lives. Sometimes our everyday lives are counter Will, or will counter the ministry of the church. That's why sometimes, not everybody, because I don't really, I don't really put down people, and I used to be one to do. I, I used to preach like and teach like that. Uh, but there's got to be a reason why you can't bring anybody to the love of God. It's, it's got to be a reason why, and it's not the Holy Spirit. Uh, so we have to look more closely at what the church ministry is. What is the church ministry? Somebody's going to say book bags, feed the poor, uh, clothe the naked, uh, visit those who are uh, imprisoned, uh, take care of the sick, the widows, uh, 
Paul says the widows indeed are those who are definitely old and on their own, older and on their own. Uh, Paul says make definite care that we uh, sure that we take care of these persons. And all of these things sound like great works in the church, and they are. But the ministry of the church, the the work of the church in in totality, is to make the love of God known to all the world. All the world encompasses all that we branch about. Remember God's conversation with Joshua over there in uh, chapter two or chapter one, when God tells Joshua, as I was with Moses, so, so shall I be with you. He says, don't fear. Don't have any fear. Hold on to my word. If you hold on to my word, he says, everywhere your feet travels, every ground your feet uh, comes across, I will give it to you. It's in Joshua chapter 1. Wherever you go, wherever your feet stand, I will be with you. And that's important because the church has a lot of place to go, but she can't be everywhere at one time, not Garfield Greater Heights. But all of us individually go different places and we cover enough places that if we're modeling the love of God and we're doing the ministry of the church and making God's love known, it's not just the giving away of monies. It's not just the giving away of gifts. It's not just giving somebody a ride. It's not just giving somebody advice. It's not just, it's more about using those avenues to present God to people or to present the love of God, the comfort of God. Everybody knows about God and everybody's heard of God. And I shared this with us a long time ago, probably earlier this year or maybe last year, but everybody has not experienced the love of God. So when I'm giving somebody a ride, when I'm giving somebody some money, when I'm putting clothes on somebody's back, when I'm giving somebody godly counsel, when I'm comforting somebody, uh, when I'm doing all of these things, I'm not doing it for a thank you. I'm not doing it to say, oh yeah, I'm a Christian. That's what I'm supposed to do. I'm doing it because God has given me this avenue or God has given me this moment as a vehicle to introduce his love for this particular person. A lot of times you can just say it just like that. You, you know, God really loves you. You know, God has a special place in his heart for you. And, and that sometimes can just stop people in their tracks because it's, it's just a not a, a normal conversation. <laughs> Just to tell somebody, well, you know God really loves you. You know God really has a special place in his heart for you. That's that's a different conversation versus, hey, come and go to church with me. That, that can catch people's attention when you just hit them with, you know God really loves you. You know God has a special place in his heart for you. He, he, he wanted me to make sure you know that. And when everybody hears that, when people hear those words that God has a special place in his heart for me and God really loves me, it, it gets their attention. Even if they don't acknowledge it right then, they'll come back later to say, what do you mean by God? I thought God loves everybody. Yeah, he might love everybody, but right now I need you to know, he wants you to know that God, that he loves you. See? And, and when we can work in this measurement uh, into of the fullness of Christ, and the reason why it's so important for all of us to grow up, here's why we come out together as a congregated people. This is why individual worship at home is not all that is cracked up to be, is because Paul says in verse number 14, as we grow up into the uh, full stature or the measurement of Christ, and he's talking about the fullness where we are convicted. We are convicted, I said Sunday, and we walk inside of our confession. 
We're not only convicted, we're converted and we walk inside of our confession. Convicted, converted, and we walk in our confession. Let me say that one more time. We are convicted, we are converted, and we walk in our confession. That's what it means to, to, to grow up in the fullness of Christ. Convicted, convinced, converted, and walking in our confession that we are followers and disciples of the Christ, the Son of God. Uh, and we believe that he's the Son of God. We say that we believe that we must be convicted and converted to that belief. Why is it so important for all of us to come out together? All of you on this thread right now and those that will hear this later, you know somebody that doesn't go to church. How do you help them? What words do you have for them that can encourage them to want to come out and, and, and understand the need to be out in congregated worship? Here's why. Paul makes it clear. Uh, look at number uh, 13 again. Paul says, until we all attain to the unity of the faith, we're in Ephesians chapter 4, and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature person, maturing Christians, we're growing Christians, to the measure of the statue which belongs to the fullness of Christ, convinced, converted, confession, convinced or convicted, converted, completely turned over. Yes, we're always changing. Yes, we're always uh, morphing into a more holy person. But the morph and the understanding of the need to morph it should always be present, um, convinced, converted, confession. I keep saying that because you need to have these things in your arsenal to understand the ministry and the need to come together as a unified people. Listen, what he says in verse number 14. As a result, we are no longer to be children. See, he contrasted. Let's keep coming out together uh, united as a united congregated people. Let's be taught by our evangelists, by our pastors and teachers. Uh, let's be taught by these people what our ministry looks like, what the work of the church looks like, uh, so it can mature us into people whose worthy walk looks like people who are convinced, converted, and they are walking in their confession so that we do not look like children who are tossed to and fro by every wind and wave of doctrine by the trickery of men. That should have caught your attention right there. Because I'm going to tell you something, and, I, and I'm going to say this with everything I have inside of me as far as love, but it needs to be said. One of the most remarkable evidences of Christians, I'm talking about born again, blood bought, buried in baptism, Christians are Christians who hold God as the holder of their faith or Jesus, the Hebrew writer says in Hebrews chapter 12, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher, the progenitor and the omega of our faith. He says, people who says this right here, astrology is a guidance for their life let, let me say that again astrology is a guidance for their life it's it's amazing to me when i look and when i hear and, and people are still talking about cancers and, and aquarius and sagittarius is like God doesn't hold their faith. Like Jesus Christ is not the author of their faith. They put their faith in, in the moon and the stars and the alignment of, of the night and, and all of these kind of superstition or sorcery type things. And, and so 
when we are children, we're tossed with every wind of, of doctrine by the trickery of men. Somebody will come along and say, well, it's okay if you believe in astrology, just as long as you know that Jesus is still your Lord. That's trickery. Uh, you don't have to take communion uh, every Sunday. It's not going to kill you if you don't. That's trickery. You say, but do you have to take it? If you're able, you should take it. You don't have to go to church uh, to be a saved, to be a member of the church. That's trickery. And then you have people in the church with two different ideas. People in the same congregated worship having two different ideas about the ministry and the work of the church because you're children. You have a childlike maturation of spirituality that won't allow you to be mature because you won't come and be taught. It's not always about the church leadership. Sometimes it's about people that just won't uh, cooperate. Uh, you, you gotta cooperate with the congregation, congregated intention of growth. So when people don't cooperate, then we continue to have people who think that, oh, I've tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, craftiness and deceitful scheming. See, uh, the trickery of men, craftiness, deceit, scheming are all attributes associated with a demonic presence or a devilish uh, interference. Um, and when people in the church are confused about so many things that would otherwise be elementary, and I'm saying this carefully because I want you never to think that there is a foolish question. There are none. Well, that, well, anyway, there are none. Uh, there's not a question necessarily that should not be asked concerning the faith or the doctrine. But for some of the elementary things, the Hebrew writer addresses again in Hebrews chapter 5, when he says at a time you ought to be teachers. See, we get mad when somebody tells us that in the church, but we turn right over and read it. Remember I said that the Bible was not necessarily written to us, but it was written for us. It was not necessarily written to us, but it was written for us. So he says in Hebrews uh, 5, verse 12 and following, he says, for the time you ought to be teacher. I like the NASB. For though by this time, Look what, look what the author says in verse number 11. Concerning him, we have much to say. Now, if you, if you take Hebrews uh, 5, verse 11 and following, it brings you right back to where we are right now. Listen, because it says we come together. We come together to grow up in the fullness of statute, knowledge, until the measure of of the fullness of the madness of mature person in Christ or of Christ. But this right here says concerning Christ. We have a lot to say and it's hard to explain to you since you have become dull of hearing. Listen, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you. Now, a lot of you might not admit that you need to be taught again. A lot of you might not confess that you know you should be along further in your understanding and, and work of the ministry by now, or your knowledge. A lot of you won't admit it, but you'll con continue to be tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. How many ways can a person be saved? Is this the only way a person can be saved? Questions like this that ought, by now you ought to know the difference. You ought to know what the Lord has said because it's elementary. Chapter 6 tells you that, therefore, leaving the elementary teaching about the Christ, Hebrews chapter 6. Look at, look at, look at your Bible. That's your Bible. Hebrews chapter 6. 
verse 1 and following. Therefore, leaving the elementary teaching about the Christ, let us press on to maturity. So whoever wrote Hebrews, this is mystery, understood what the Holy Spirit said to Paul. And if we want to just be cut right to the chase, the Holy Spirit is the inspiration of the word. So the Holy Spirit told Paul the same thing it told this mysterious writer. And they both wrote the same thing. It's time for us to grow up, but we can't grow up fragmented. We can't grow up as people come to worship Sunday every Sunday and have no intention of changing Monday. They're not convinced or they're not convicted. They're not converted and not walking in their confession. That's why we have a lot of saints, and it's not just at Garfield. So don't look in at the church like it's just us. No, it's not just us. It's a lot of the church throughout. Not convicted, not converted, and not walking in our confession. Uh, it, it leaves us vulnerable to the tricky trickery or cunningness or craftiness of man and his deceitful doctrine or teachings. Uh, and so we're still, I tell people all the time that uh, my, my intent right now with our congregation is to just grow us in our faith and understanding in the most base place. I say most base, not not belittling or, or judging or demeaning. No, no, no conversation like that is in my heart. I meant to just get us rallied to the same place. So when we move out and move forward, everybody has one understanding. And Satan, when we build that kind of fort, it's hard for Satan to get in. Uh, somebody said the church is only strong as its weakest Christian. I believe that to some degree, because if there's a weak link, Satan will use that to get inside and infiltrate the old Trojan horse uh, story. They will use that to get inside and start being disruptive and destructive inside the house of God, because some of us are not able to resist or identify the trickery or cunningness of men. When you know what God has said, you know what God has authorized, and you know some things God has instructed, but you elect to do contrary by the lead of somebody else, then you are still children tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. That's why the Thessalonian writer, which is the Apostle Paul, says, uh, we are to prove all things and hold fast to that which is good. Some things we got to just put to the test. Some things we have to just put to the test. We got to put some things to the test when people are saying things and people are are kind of trying to persuade and move us. If it moves me outside of my conviction, that's a no-no. If it moves me in a place that doesn't look like I'm converted, I don't want to hear that stuff about we all sin or we all got struggles. We all mess up here and there. Yeah, that that's that's... We're not talking about none of that right now. If what I'm hearing and if what I'm being suggested moves me away from my, it doesn't look like I'm convicted in my obedience to the faith or my hope or patient waiting for Christ to come. If it looks like I'm not converted, if I'm called to do something, enticed to do something, instructed, or led to believe I can just do whatever I want to do, that that's part of my liberty in Christ Jesus. If it makes me look like I'm not in my confession, that I believe in he's the Lord and Savior, that I'm believing he's the redeemer of my soul, if, I, if I'm not waiting like the bride, uh, the, uh, the brides in the chamber who are waiting with their lamps lit or their lanterns full of oil, if I'm not ready at that time, it doesn't look like that, then I ought not be led astray. 
we don't have enough we don't have enough christians that have the power to lead others because we're too busy trying to lead ourselves and we won't come out together to be led y'all quiet i'm, I'm teaching better than y'all shouting christians have got to get together and come out together in unified worship to learn the work of the ministry so that we're not caught up by the wiles of satan paul told the church of corinth i would not have you ignorant to the devices of satan satan has a plan satan has a strategy satan has an attack just for you how many of you know that satan has a strategy satan has a scheme satan has a plan satan has an attack specifically for you how many of you know that but here's the thing about coming out together in congregated worship here's the thing about coming out in congregated class and studying and, and hearing and being together as we strengthen each other in the most precious faith. Here's the thing about being matured in Christ. Here's the thing about uh, not being tricked uh, by the by the cunnery or the cunning or cunningness of, of Satan. Because when we come out together, when we come out together, we learn that no matter what Satan's plan is for me, what Satan's plan is for you, you know what we learn? That Satan is an enemy of the kingdom. He's an enemy of Christ. And the only way he can get to God, see, Satan is no match for God. I, I want you to stop thinking and stop saying it's a part of maturing that there's a war going on between God and the devil. Nobody's warring against God because God is almighty. <laughs> Satan is at war with the church, the people of God, because he can't do anything with God. So the war is not between the devil and God. The war is between the people of God and the devil. Uh, so when we think about all, uh, all that we are uh, I was looking for this particular passage. First John chapter two. Uh, so to make it say, yes, he wanted to keep us from being congregated. We are strengthened and unified. Fellow, he's an enemy of togetherness. Absolutely. 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 He's, he's an enemy because um, I, I want to write this down. So I'm gonna go. I'm, I'm gonna go somewhere, and I want you to get to this passage right here first. Because no matter what plan Satan has for you, no matter his scheme or his trickery or his plan, because they're individually designed. And and, and let me share. And let me share something with you, Church. The Hebrew writer says, seeing as we have such a host of witnesses that encompasses us about, they're cheering, they're rooting, they're looking down on us. All the saints that have traveled this road before, all the saints in the land all about us that are pulling and hoping one for another. As I taught Sunday, we should be praying for each other, giving thanks for all the saints. Uh, because all of these are witnesses of what we're going through. They're, they're witnessing the same thing as children of God. So they're, we're rooting for one another. But the ideal of the Hebrew writer is a coliseum where, where those who are not actively participants in the game that's, that they're witnessing, they're sitting in a coliseum setting and they're watching the engagement and they're pulling for the matador to conquer the bull. So he says, let us lay aside every sin and weight that so easily beset us. 
sin and weight that so easily beset us. Every sin, every weight, let us lay it aside. Why? Because everything, every plan that Satan has for you to destroy and disrupt the unity is a sinful. See, all of his plans, as innocent as they might look in humanity, the Bible says in, in 1 John uh, chapter 2, verse 16, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. But this world is passing away in all the lust. But not all of his lust. Listen to me. Satan can Satan because he's clever. He takes an ill fate like COVID and he turns it into a scare tactic that destroys and disrupts and interferes with, watch this, your conviction, your conversion, and your confession. See? COVID didn't hit everybody the same. It's not, this has nothing to do with the church that stayed open or the church that closed. No, 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 no. It has nothing to do with that. It has more to do with what was taken into the mind and heart of those. Because even though some church doors didn't close, everybody didn't go. And everybody hasn't come back. So don't let those churches that stay open fool you. <laughs> Acting like they didn't suffer any casualties or any wounded uh, in the COVID, in the height of COVID uh, interlude. So when we look at the invasion of COVID, watch this. COVID was not a, it's not a sin. That's why the writer says, lay aside every sin and every weight. The devil can take a weight and hang it about you and interfere with your race running. He takes the weight and bogs you down with it so that you can no longer run the race. Y'all not even getting this. Because he took something that was potentially, oh, wait a minute, he took something that has nothing to do with your soul salvation and he used it trickery then you get the news you get the cdc and you and you get the health people and and you get your neighbor and you get your job and and everybody has a different ideal about covid-19 and it's and it's been real this message is not about the realness of covid at all it's not about an uh, ignorance to those who have lost lives is not a, an ignorance of those who still suffer now with symptoms and repercussions from the COVID attack. No, it's not an ignorance to any of these things. Uh, the seriousness of, of COVID-19. No, it's not an ignorance. But what it does not do is COVID cannot interfere with your conviction your conversion, and your confession. See, but Satan's plan with you with COVID might have been different from me. See, we got we to gotta be a people of, of radical faith and, and coming together in a congregated effort, learning strengthens us in a radical faith. Some of us move about every day freely but won't come to worship service. Just be honest. I mean, we move about the world freely and won't come to worship service. Y'all didn't like that? I, I'm, I'm sorry. I got. I got to tell y'all the truth, though. I, I wouldn't be. I wouldn't be right if I didn't tell you the truth. I said I was going to show you something. 
about coming together. And so why we can't, why we would no longer be, I, I gave you this before, so I don't even know why I'm going back to give it to you again. But they say repetition is one of the greatest strengths of teaching. So uh, I guess repeating it won't won't hurt us. Um, Genesis chapter 11. Some of you guys already know where I'm going because you've been with me long enough now. And you say you're going there again. Yes, I'm going there again because you missed it the first time. <laughs> Five and six. Genesis eleven. Look at look at the wisdom of God, even in negative place. Now, if this is God in a negative place, what does it mean for you and me, or you and I, with the power of the Holy Spirit? who were brought into a unified position. See, these people are learning unification. They have learned the power of unification. They have identified with the power of unification. We come out uh, under the pastors, teachers, evangelists, uh, those people with the prophets and the apostles to learn the work of the ministry to become into a mature people in Christ so that we no longer be children tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, trickery of men, cunning, deceitfulness, schemes of ungodliness. Because unity in knowledge, unity in our conviction, our conversion, and our confession brings about a people who are strong enough to defend false doctrines and demonic teachings. Look what God said. With these people unified. Genesis chapter 11, verses 5 through 6. This is the the uh, uh, the, the time of Babylon, or, or time of, of, of Babel, Tower of Babel. And they are uh, building uh, their own stairway. Look at verse number 4. They said, come let us build for ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach into heaven let us make for ourselves a name. People today still talking about making their own name. I, 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 these are these are children tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. Listen to what he says. Let us make for ourselves a name; otherwise, we will be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. They counted God out, but they said, "If we come together, nothing can penetrate us." Y'all missed our shout, church. Because if the church comes together unified in knowledge, unified in their conviction, unified in their conversion, unified in their confession, nothing can spread us and scatter us. Listen. The Lord, they got God's attention because they were together. The Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. The Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they all have the same language. And this is what they begin to do. Just listen to what God says. And now nothing which they purpose to do will be impossible for them. Now, this is God speaking about a negative unity. Nothing they do will be impossible for them. Why? Because of their unity, nothing penetrates, nothing scatters. That's why we have to come out together to be mature together so we can be uh, mature people uh, that nothing can lead us astray. Nothing can scatter us. And now we're all fit for the work of the, of the ministry of the work of the kingdom. Equipping us for the work of the ministry. See? God said nothing that they set their mind to do 
would be impossible for them. Why would you say that, God? Because they are unified in one language, one mind and one thought. Isn't that what Paul's talking about here? <laughs> Being unified in one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. Same message, but now we're doing so up under the headship of Jesus Christ. No need to keep talking about the body without talking about the head. See, the head is what unites us and gives us the united power. Now he says, grow up as one people. And guess what, Garfield, Greater Heights, Church of Christ throughout the land, if we grow up as one people in the maturity of Christ, nothing would be impossible for us. That's all we got time for tonight. We got to grow up. So nothing would be impossible for us. Nothing would be impossible for us if we grow up. If we grow up. If we grow up, nothing would be impossible for us. But we got to grow together. We've got to grow together. We've got to grow together. You, you can't grow, you can't do it by yourself at home. And if anybody's telling you that, that's because you are a child being tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, trickery, craftiness, deceitfulness, or scheming. Nothing would be impossible for us because we have the Holy Spirit. So we're God authorized. We don't have to build a tower to heaven. Jesus Christ is our tower to heaven. And so we're not working to be saved. We work because we are saved. Now, y'all heard me say that a thousand times. Y'all have had it in y'all. Y'all have been to quote that like it's Bible. We don't work to be saved. We work because we are saved. And since we work because we are saved, we want to work in the mightiness of maturity. As one people, you at home, you need to come on out. You who said, I've never probably want, I never want to worship a church again, come on out anyway. Prayer request, prayer request, prayer request, prayer request. <laughs> Uh, I know my sister is on here, so she probably would ask it, but I was asked by uh, Sister Barbara Thornton to pray for, oh, there she is, if you really love the Lord, like you say you do, then put that mask on and come out to be among the saints. We welcome you all at Garfield Greater Heights. Amen. Amen. That's right, sister. That's right. Listen here. Sister Barbara asked for prayers for her neighbor whose child is in a difficult bout, uh, difficult way. If she wants to address it, she can type it in herself. I'm sure she'll probably mention it again Sunday. Uh, uh, thank you, brother. Sister said, I heard today that God has purposed to serve, to build up the kingdom. And if you aren't serving, you are stagnating the growth and will answer. You don't want to be in the way of God's work. I got to tell you, God's work is going to roll on. I wish I had time to go get that passage that says it's better, it's better, it's better, it's better that you throw yourself and break yourself against the rock, except the rock run you over and crush you to nothing. So you better break yourself, uh, uh, check yourself before you wreck yourself. Uh, we got to, uh, I saw a couple of words here I want to acknowledge. Pray for Yvonne and her family, definitely going to pray for you. Denise, your safe travel, definitely going to pray for you. Uh, Connie wants to keep her and Christopher in prayer and, and their walk uh, in prayer. And my good sister, Jackie, what's going on, Jackie? Uh, yes, God is awesome. Uh, LaCroix is going to a family reunion this weekend. If they decide to go, we definitely will keep you in prayer, brothers. Keep us posted. We definitely want to keep you in prayer. Uh, Tess, good to see you. Thank God for you. We're praying for you all. As I was saying, and I got I got distracted. Uh, Sister Thornton has a neighbor whose child is in a 
a bad, bad uh, way. Uh, we're praying for the comfort of the family. Uh, uh, we're praying for uh, God to give uh, Sister Barbara an avenue. Remember we talked about that earlier in the class, the work of the ministry, the work of the ministry of the church, the ministry, that's a definite article, the church, not works, because that could be anything, but uh, equipping them for the work of the ministry, the work there means we are here to make the invisible God visible. We are here to make the love of God known of those who have never experienced the love of God. So we're going to pray that God presents the avenue for Barbara to operate in that will give her neighbors an exposure or an experience, excuse me, with the love of God. So we're going to pray for that family. So it's good to see Jackie. We're always praying for you, Jackie, your strength, and our good brother Darren as well in the recovery of his health. We got Daisy. We got Sister Yolanda Patterson out there somewhere. Uh, we know we're trying to pray for them that their health is restored and, and God continues to hold them in the place that they are. Uh, we, we got we got a family member that I need you to pray dearly for. Uh, uh, he's he's in a serious way as well. Uh, my mother's cousin was sent home today uh, for, uh, for for hospice care uh, as an older cousin of my uh, auntie's. Uh, auntie's son but my mother's cousin and so we want to keep uh that part of our family in prayer we have another family member that just needs the prayers of the church right now uh in a great way so we have a lot of things could never forget our youth not just in our congregation but our youth in school uh whatever grade that is from preschool through graduate school we we'll to keep all our youth in prayer keep all our seniors in prayer uh we don't just pray for our youth we got to pray for our our wisdom in the church as well. Our, our, our citizens, our Ben's, our, our Jerry's, our Barbers, our Rosines, our, uh, uh, my call somebody's going to say, I ain't if they ain't no, <laughs> we, want to keep, we want to keep all of those who have been with God for a while in our prayer as well. Um, ben, his family, of course, Ben always wants to see his children, not in the parking lot, but in the doors. So we want to keep Ben in prayer uh, and his, his health and his children, Sister Cotton, all that she's uh, got going on, want to keep her in prayer with her health, her mind, and her household uh, place of understanding as well. Thank you all. It's 802. Let's go to God in the Word. Please keep our plight in hand. You know what that is. I won't type it. I won't text it. I won't say it. We're going to keep this between our ears and between the Lord. We're going to pray for the Clark family for their loss. Absolutely. Uh, just a test. we got to do that as well. So we want to keep the Clark family in our prayers as well. So let's go to God in the word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you. We bless your holy name. All the requests that have been typed, you searched their hearts. You've known their hearts from the beginning of time. You know what they was going to say even on tonight. God, bless them according to that which they stand the most in need of, that which all will bring you glory and bring them comfort in your presence as well. We thank you for Jesus the Christ. Continue to hold Garfield Greater Heights in your hand. Help her to grow in maturity for the work of the ministry and to the full stature that we can deny every foreign doctrine and teaching that's contrary to the unity of your kingdom. Father God, we love you. Be with us, guide us, and bless us. For those that will be traveling, we're praying for their safety. For those that have returned from traveling, we thank you for their safety as well. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we do pray. Amen. God bless y'all. And that we will... Um, See you Sunday. The Lord say the same. God bless you. We'll see you Sunday.